This camera maker joined the downsizing that began in the 1970s. But did it take things too far? Let's look at it. The Pentax MX was the first real camera that I owned. Uh, I bought this in 1978. I was up in Maine at the time. I, was sta I should say I was stationed in Maine at the time. Uh, I was in the Air Force, and, uh, and Maine was my first uh, duty assignment. Anyway, by the time I got up there, I had uh, moved on from my Cosmo X. Uh, I'm not really sure what happened to it, uh, but I did want a camera. I uh, initially had bought a little Konica C35 automatic, uh, but then I really wanted the flexibility again of a single lens reflex camera. Uh, a fellow uh, airman or a fellow soldier, whichever you whichever you prefer, uh, he was using an Olympus OM-1. He liked it. He really liked it a lot. Uh, one of the things he liked about it was its small size uh, and the fact that you know it wasn't as large as a uh, as a traditional uh, single lens reflex camera prior to olympus uh, the cameras had become quite large and uh, you know i well i'll show you in a second so anyway uh, uh this led me to do uh do a lot of research and uh, eventually i ended up with this pentax mx i don't re this this isn't the same camera i'm actually working to uh repurchase that camera but uh i ended up with a pentax mx i guess i should say it was um it had had a 50 millimeter f 2.0 lens and uh, i liked it quite a bit i shot with it i shot with it for the next two years until i sold it to a uh who did I sell? Oh, I sold it to my brother, who in turn uh, sold it to a friend of mine. What's to like about this camera? First of all, it's an all-manual camera, meaning that um, even if the batteries uh, die, you can con continue shooting. Uh, for that time, it, you know, I think it met all the same specifications. It had shutter speeds running from one to one thousandth of a second. Uh, it had. Uh, Oh, it had the ability to add either a winder or a motor drive attachment. And really, it was outfitted, it was really designed for the uh, professional photographer. Um, at the time, um, it, well, it never really caught on. It never really caught on with the pros, but regardless, it's still a very, very solid uh, camera. Well, let's take a closer look at this camera. This used the K-mount. The K-mount, of course, replaced the uh, 42 millimeter screw mount. The 42 millimeter screw mount had been, actually, had been developed for the um, the the first, uh, well, what many claim to be the first um, single lens reflex camera. Of course, there are uh, there are quite a few stories that you know perhaps it wasn't. But anyway, the first one was produced by. Um, Pentacon in East Germany, but at that time it was East German uh, Carl, East German Zeiss Icon. That 42 millimeter screw mount went on to become popular popularized with the Pentax Spotmatic cameras. It was also used by um, a number of other camera makers, including let me see, Vivitar had a line of uh, screw mount cameras. I want to say Mamiya, Mamaya. I'm not never really been quite sure on how to pronounce that. I should look it up. And as I recall, uh, Fujika uh, also had some screw mount cameras. Um, oh, oh, and then of course, uh, after Zeiss Icon became Pentacon, it there was also a line of uh, screw mount cameras as well. Of course, that was the original. At some point, it became the uh, became sometimes known as the Pentax 42 millimeter mount or the Pentax screw mount, and while that wasn't uh, entirely accurate, you can see how that came to be, uh, with the Pentax Spotmatic being such a popular camera. Regardless, at some point, uh, Pentax in the world moved on, in the photographic world, moved on from the screw mount, and uh, the K-mount became uh, the, uh, the primary uh, Pentax mount. So instead of screwing the lens onto the camera, you simply uh, just, it was a bayonet mount. Bayonet mounts were and still are very popular and in use today, even with digital cameras. What attracted it to me in the first place was its size. You know, as you can see, fairly small size. Uh, it came with a wide, wide range of lenses. I think I ended up with maybe three lenses. So, you know, despite the fact that it had this uh, wide range of lenses, I never really took advantage of it because I was living on a soldier salary, which um, 
in the 1970s wasn't an incredibly uh, large amount of money. So uh, let's see. As I mentioned, it was fully automatic or fully manual. It uses two uh, button cells, either LR44 or S76. And as always, use either silver oxide or lithium. Uh, never use alkaline batteries in a camera. Somewhat like the Pentax Spotmatic, this was an incredibly easy camera to use. Really, all you did was um, set your exposure, focus, and shoot. I've always felt, and this is true even with my original uh, MX, even though this isn't the one I had bought originally. I uh, later bought this around 2002 or 2003, that this uh, shutter speed dial is much too tightly sprung. As you can see, it does take quite a bit of effort to turn it. And when you're holding it up to your eye... It's easier if you can just turn it quickly with your uh, index finger. I, I don't think it should take this much effort just to change the shutter speed. That's probably my primary complaint. My secondary complaint is uh, for those of us with slightly larger or larger than normal hands, the Pentax is, MX is almost too small of a camera. And uh, I didn't know that I would ever say that, but it's true. It is almost too small of a camera. Now, there are many lens, lenses made available for the Pentax. And I think at some point I ended up with a, the little 40 millimeter pan, pancake lens. So the 40 millimeter pancake lens, I believe this is a Tessar type. Um, be, simply because I don't think they could fit more than four elements into this, um, into this tiny lens. You know what, let me remove the lens shade, then you can really get an idea of just how thin this lens is. And so you can see, it's really, what, half the, half the, uh, half the size, well, not, of course, half the physical size, but um, half the length of a standard 50 millimeter lens. And so when paired with the uh, MX, this was almost a pocketable camera. You could certainly slip it into like the pocket of a winter uh, coat. Uh, I doubt you could slip it into a suit coat, but with the 40 millimeter lens, it does become very diminutive. Let me point out another couple things. Uh, one is there's a depth of field preview. You can see that when you push this lever toward the body, it closes down the lens. How is that useful? Well, uh, back in the day, if you wanted to get an idea of what would be in focus in your photo, you could use your what was called the depth of field preview lever. Of course, it darkened the image in the viewfinders. You know, just keep that in mind. There were a lot of little things we used to do back in the film days. Uh, this is a shutter, a shutter release lock. And this was important because Partially, by partially depressing the shutter release, it also turns on the meter. When you pull this advance to its standoff position and press it, it would stay on for like 15 seconds. So this, this uh, served two purposes. One was accidental ac activation of the meter and accidental uh, taking of a photograph. Um, you know, what, what a lot of people did was they would always wind on to the next frame. And you'll see how that little... So when you do wind, when you do tension the shutter and wind to the next frame, you'll see this little window here. This little window here turn orange. It's a good way to always be prepared, but it's also a good way to accidentally take your photo, if you, especially if you had it in a bag. So if you happen to just grab it and pull it up, you could see how that you could uh, trip the shutter when you didn't mean to. Uh, the uh, Film speed setting is right here, so there's a small silver um, pin. You push that, and then you rotate that until you are at your desired film speed. I think this had speeds running from, let's see, most of them went up to 1600 and down to 25. In fact, this one went down to 25. So this was pretty standard. It covered the whole range of speeds. Um, I think, oh, Kodachrome actually was offered in two speeds. Kodachrome was uh, Kodak's uh, uh, um, excellent, excellent slide film, transparency film. And so it, had, it was offered at two speeds, uh, Kodachrome 25 and 64. 64 was often known as being a bit too red, uh, but uh, this isn't really a film discussion. And then you had your rewind crank, which doubled, is also a way to open the back. 
and to open the back, you would pull up on the rewind crank. Then just, I usually just used to pop two fingers under here, and then the back pops open. Very simple. So in the back, here in the back of the camera, it's a uh, fairly standard. Your fresh roll of film goes here, and it runs across these rails. Uh, this used what they called magic fingers. So what you would do, you could just insert the film leader in between these magic fingers, and then use your thumb to turn this uh, this this spindle until the film caught. Then you would close the back. This is your pressure plate, and of course the pressure plate. The purpose of the pressure plate is simply to keep the film flat against the film plane and flat against these rails. This is a fairly large viewfinder. Notice that this has a square. Uh, some camera makers had a circular um, eyepiece. This had a rectangular eyepiece made of plastic. And this was good, especially if you were an eyeglass wearer, because it wouldn't scratch your eyeglasses like, uh, like some cameras would. Let's take a quick look inside the uh, viewfinder. Inside the viewfinder, the viewfinder was uh, fairly large and bright. That was always uh, a thing during that time. How bright was the viewfinder? There was a small window above the viewfinder and that had the, uh, the aperture, f-stop, if you will. So you can see the small window here and what it did was it just it had a small prism that was angled toward the, um, the aperture setting. So it would display that right here. Now in the center was your horizontally uh, split image. Surrounding that was a what they called a ground glass collar. And then this was a Fresnel screen. Now on this side was a semicircular thing with a um, tr semicircular transparent dial and it had all your shutter speeds. It actually isn't quite that big. You want to over or underexpose, and so you know that was the uh, purpose of of those having so many. It actually, you know, the idea was to try to give you as much accuracy and as possible when setting your exposure. Your strap lugs, of course, self timer, uh, <clears throat> and lens release. There is one thing, there's a little trick, and this is true for many Pentax cameras. If you lightly tapped on the, um, on the uh, uh, shutter release, you can get the mirror to lock up. With its introduction of K-series uh, bodies, Pentax also released a vast number of uh, K-mount lenses, and there were two types. There were two types. There were just the uh, K-mount lenses, and then there were the M lenses. The M were supposed to go with the M bodies, MX, ME. Uh, the ME actually was the, um, was the automatic uh, version of the MX. And the idea was that these, uh, these lenses were more compact than their, um, than their full-size counterparts offered by other camera makers. And so, uh, you know, I just gathered a couple lenses as an example. We'll take a quick look at some of the other lenses. Uh, so here's a 50 millimeter. This is a 1.8 uh, Canon uh, FD. And this is 1.7. For all intents and purposes, uh, 1.7 is the same as 1.8. You can see how the um, Pentax M lens, all the uh, Pentax M lenses were certainly marked as that Pentax M. So you can see the, how this, the 50 millimeter lens, is noticeably shorter than the uh, than the Canon. And and you'll see that this actually follows suit with other lenses. Okay, so I have a 28 millimeter lens. Um, I don't have a huge number of Pentax lenses. I have a, a small number. So this is a this is a Pentax M 28 millimeter, and this is a 28 millimeter Nikkor. Once again, uh, smaller and uh, well, certainly lengthwise from flange to end of the lens, um, certainly not nearly as large. This is, and this is a, this is a faster lens. This is a 2.8 and this is a 3.5 lens. Generally, the faster a lens get, the large, the faster a lens is, the larger the lens becomes. This here, this is a um, Vivitar 135 millimeter lens. This also is a screw mount, so. But you, once again, you can see how this lens the M lens is, once again, noticeably shorter than the uh, than the traditional 135 millimeter lens. 
finally, uh, I do have a high speed um, 1.4 lens. I don't know if there was ever a 1.2 lens. If there was, I never purchased it. Once again, another generalization, but the faster a lens is, the more expensive it is too. So this is a 1.4 uh, Pentax M lens, as you can see, and this is the uh, Carl Zeiss 1.4 in screw mount, ironically. You really can see the difference once again here, where the Pentax lens, for being a fast lens, is still noticeably shorter. In fact, if you compare the 1.4 to the Canon, it is just slightly uh, shorter than the Canon, ever so slightly. The Pentax MX had interchangeable focusing screens, and that was really a testament to it being developed or, or targeted to the pro market. They were fairly uh, simple to change. All you had to do was get in here with the small tool that was included, pop up this little lever. Of course, I don't have the small tool anymore. Well, I do have it, but I can't, don't know where it is offhand. Uh, just pull up on that small lever and then the uh, focusing screen would drop out. This also was useful if you wanted to uh, clean, clean the focusing screen. Then you just put it back in, pop this uh, frame back into place, and you're good to go. The camera had two synchronization ports. Uh, one, well, one, one at the top, one at the bottom. One was for bulb flash and one was for electronic flash. That is if you're using the flash off camera. Uh, so, since most of us um, just would get a small flash unit slotted in here, you didn't really have to worry about that. Your flash synchronization speed was 1 60th of a second. And so if you could use any one six one sixtieth of a second or slower, uh, but that was the fastest speed that you could use. Uh, having a one sixtieth speed probably limited its use in studio situations and uh, possibly outdoors. This didn't really have a dedicated flash, you know, which would uh, synchronize electronically with the body. The film advance was uh, ratcheted so that you could advance the film in small increments. Most people just wound it in one stroke, that was it. But if I suppose if you were in a situation where you really just wanted to do it quietly, um, that would be the way to do it. Of course, when you release the shutter, not so quiet. Like many cameras aimed toward the professional, you could remove the back. So it was very simple. There's a small pin, raised pin, push down on that the back removes. And so what was the purpose? Uh, well, Pentax offered a 250 exposure back, which meant that you could um, load up, I think it was probably 100 feet of film. And then you could just keep shooting until that film was exhausted. I think it probably would work best if you had several backs, maybe three backs preloaded. And this would be great for uh, either sports or uh, maybe wildlife photographers who, you know, who really couldn't afford the time to reload film every 10 or 15 seconds, especially when you had a motor drive attached. There were several, several types of uh, winders available. So this was a winder, and I believe this could shoot at one frame per second. When fitted to the camera, it actually, you know, looked pretty good, right? Didn't look too bad. Made, it was still fairly compact, and you could, uh, you know, control the camera in this manner. Now, there was also a motor drive available, and the difference between a winder and a motor drive is a motor drive winds the film at much higher rates. Somewhere between, let's say, th four to five frames per second, possibly up to ten frames per second, depending on your, um, on your shutter speed, of course. And so... If you think about shooting 10 frames per second, it wouldn't take you long to burn through a roll of 36, and certainly even not through um, an entire 100-foot roll of 250 exposure. So that was useful, like I said, probably for certain documentary-type photography, uh, certainly sports, and then also, uh, and as I mentioned, wildlife photography. The Pentax MX is still widely available on the used market. Uh, if you buy one, you know, expect that you're going to have to change the, seal, the foam seals in the back. Uh, that's fairly common with all Japanese cameras. I should cover that sometime, how to uh, re-foam a camera. Aside from that, this is a very reliable camera. Uh, it, offers an ex it offers plenty of flexibility as you 
move from just being a beginner photographer to an advanced amateur or even a professional. Although, you know, I think we have to admit that professional photographers do not use film cameras anymore. You can use them for personal projects, but um, that's not how the world works today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any suggestions on cameras that you would like to see me review, please let me know in the comments below.